for tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday evening, December the 26th, 1991. The camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Charles Tromley of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, is the speaker of the evening. This is tape one of two tapes of the evening service. Appreciate the music the Lord's sending in. Before uh, Brother Tromley evening to minister and close the service. I'm going to ask Brother Walter Fletcher to come and call and say hello. I'm Brother Walter. We had the of uh, ministering with them a few weeks ago in uh, uh, Phoenix, Flagstaff, uh, Arizona, and we had the privilege of them being here to minister earlier in the year, and we just enjoy their ministry and both of them, not only in the song, but in the ministry. And we just uh, kind of the privilege to have the Fletcher family with us for these next few days. Brother Walt. Praise the Lord. It's good to be back. Some of you we remember from before. I don't remember how many months it was that we were uh, here with you last. We appreciate Brother Glenn and Irma very much. We count adopted parents in the Lord and very special relationship to us and in our hearts. Um, I'm a man under authority, so I'll do what I've been asked, and that's bring you a greeting. <laughs> I couldn't help but think, though, as we were worshiping and talking about worship and some of the things, and Brother Glenn was uh, ministering earlier out of, uh, reminded of uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1.1, where Ezekiel said while he was among the captives there at the river, the heavens were open, and he saw visions of God. I'd like to ask you tonight to consider, and as we gather together over the next few meeting times, when the heavens are open, we ought to see visions of God. Amen? There ought to be something more of God that we see. It is interesting that for Ezekiel, while he was in captivity, I mean, that, that, that's when you really want to hear from God. <laughs> When things are bumping along, you know, not now, God, I'm praying. and Not now, God, I'm busy. But when things aren't going the way they, you see, we say should, we need to see the heavens open. That's when we want to get a perspective from God. And uh, Brother Glenn was reading from First John 1, that which we've seen, that which we've heard, that which our hands have handled, declare. I don't have a testimony, by the way, unless something has Touch your spirit in your life and something that can flow through you. Amen? And uh, one of the uh, difficulties that we're discovering is that many people have hewn out cisterns of their own make. They can't hold water. And therefore, they're finding it difficult to pour out. And what's happening is God's pouring in, but it's pouring in through leaky vessels. Are you there? That's all right to be a broken, a broken and a... Uh, contrite heart he'll not despise amen become leaky vessels that we've uh, designed of our own making we're seeing today and my wife and i we travel uh, from one end of the country to the other sometime the lord lets us go overseas in particular in this hour that uh, you know we've we've talked so much about uh, the type of thing that god was building that it, it seems as though many people believe that in and of themselves are you there and I believe we're really digressing in one sense of the word, not in terms of what God's doing. We're beginning to, to get the message, but we're beginning to see that, that God isn't after uh, us in and of ourselves producing fruit. But I think we're, we've gotten so bad that there are ministries today that think they can even produce the seed. Are you there? How many of you know that the law of the seed is everything produces after its own kind? That which is of the flesh is flesh. Never be anything else. But there's a converse side. That which is of the Spirit is Spirit. Amen? 
And God is about bringing a people who will have not only spiritual sight, spiritual objective, directive, and function. Amen? And when we see that, when we get a vision of Him, and see Him for who He is, then something happens inside of us. That which takes place, the seed that's birthed in us by that vision will transform that which is around us. Amen? So let's get an objective. I don't want only deliverance, I want possession. Come on. It isn't enough to get delivered. I need possession. I, I'm, I want to be delivered that he might possess every part of me, all my mind, soul, body. Amen. So we look forward to these times together, and we hope that we'll be able to uh, just share a portion in what God's doing. We know we don't have all, but we have really laid ourselves aside for a couple of weeks waiting on the Lord. And I really feel the Lord has given us some things that are going to be very useful to us all. God bless you. Brother Charles Conway, Oklahoma. Some of you who may have not have met before, I know a lot of you have, and some of you may not have, really ministers to minister to ministers. And uh, it's a privilege to have them here. And when he says amen this evening... The service will be concluded, and you'll be ready to go to bed. Uh, so, Brother Tomley, come and minister unto us in the Lord. For anyone who understands the moving of the Spirit, getting in a pre-wheeling meeting like this, you feel like a man squirrel hunting with a machine gun. You don't want to shoot the squirrel out of the tree. You want to shoot the whole top of the tree off. And, and, and this is so true. We, we, we sense it all. When Brother Glenn was saying that some of you may not understand deliverance and some of the people across the country don't, they don't understand it, so that need it. But the prime objective is to learn how to enter his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And one of the things that I want to minister later during the week is the priesthood that God is putting together for these end times. We're hearing so much dispensational nationalism. And if I sound a little anti, that's okay. I did my undergraduate work in a staunch conservative Southern Baptist college. I did my master's in seminary work at the staunchest conservative Southern Baptist seminary. If you don't believe it, we know when the rapture is going to take place, whether the Lord does or not. One man out of Dallas Theological Seminary was absolutely, was absolutely upset when they tore the wall down and communism fell apart. I imagine he probably felt ready for the rapture yesterday when Gorbachev resigned. Yeah. they got to find a new excuse to get Russia to come down and pick on Israel. Yes, we better pray. We got Gorbachev out and this wall down. Now there's a few more things that's got to take, that's got to happen. <laughs> Besides praying. Come on, we got to stand up and pray. <clears throat> I don't pray very good sitting down, and so I'm not going to let you do it either. Mm. Amen. Father, it's a privilege we this thank evening you, Lord to Jesus. receive these finances from your people mm. and for, <clears throat> to accept them as the priest of this place, and then to bring it as an offering unto you, Father, yeah. through Jesus, who is our high priest, to be a sweet savor mm. upon the altar before the throne. I thank you for the privilege I have to lift it up and to bring it unto you and present it to you. As, a, as an offering mm. and a sweet savor from your people. And now, fathers, I have taken it in my, to my hand, and I become steward over it. I take dominion over these finances, such as they are yet, to, and such as finances that we have. And as long as we have this type of finances, I thank you for them. Now I bind these finances to the kingdom of the living God, that they shall multiply again and again and again and again and again for the kingdom. Amen. That they shall be used for nothing but the necessities of life and the further of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. As long as this is you. And I bind these to that cause, and I pray Abraham's blessing upon these thy people, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. By the way, here we go, that shotgun thing again. That's the only way you're going to stay on top of the economic mess in America. I don't know if you're aware. Of course, we know God's in charge. Too many prayers have gone up for America for him to overlook it. So he's going to have to take away from them the one thing America depends on above all else, Santa Claus. <laughs> the God of America is spelled G-O-L-D. We ain't got none left. 
But when the economic earthquake comes, and by the way, it's been estimated at the rate we're going in debt now, one billion dollars every day, Mr. Bush is adding to the debt. One billion dollars a day. That at the rate it's, it's exploding in the last ten years, eight or ten years, that by the year 1995 to 1999, the total income of the United States government is not going to be enough to service the interest on our debt, which began with Franklin Deficit Roosevelt. Remember FDR? Stood on the streets of Hyde Park and said, I hate war. And that's all we've had since. So it's important we, we learn to trust him. But getting back to what I was saying, what the Brother Glenn was saying, Ezekiel tells us that God is going to restore priesthood, and it's not going to be this Jewish fandangle thing that they're trying to establish with everyone with the name Cohen. God says it's the Levites he's going to restore, and, and, and he's not going to let them take away my britches manufacturer. Just because their name is Levi does not make them a priest. And it's very, very important because it says when the glory of the Lord comes back into the temple, he'll come by the way of the east gate, and his voice will be like the sound of many waters. And Ezekiel said, that's the same vision I had by the gates of the, the waters of Sheba, the rivers of Sheba. And Ezekiel 1, when he opened heaven and let us see God in all of his magnificent glory, and the praise of the angels singing, holy, 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 and the voice of God was like the voice of many waters. The thing which is going to convince the New Agers and bring deliverance to mankind is not going to be more preaching. It's going to be more releasing. And you and I can't release until first we get into the presence of God. And let's face it, a lot of our praise and worship in places I have visited is anything else but praise and worship. I mean, I sat with song leaders while they practiced what they were going to praise God with for an hour. That may be good. It may be bad. But when they start, there isn't any room for the Spirit of God to come in. There's no room for Jesus in the church. It's going to change. And I'm glad. Hallelujah. Okay, you can start your camera. I want you to turn me to Mark 16 tonight. And uh, what I feel God wants to share tonight, I feel, is a very vital place in our heart. Christianity Today recently had an article, Super Church Growth Men Have Learned How to Fine-Tune Their Formulas. I have news for them, having pastored large church. You don't grow a church with formulas, or with buses, or with Sunday school programs, or a music program, or a preacher with charisma who could sell ice to Eskimos, a.k.a. Robert Tilton or someone like that. That man, I I've worked with him. Whatever he touches will turn to gold, whether it's junk cars or what. And there's no God in it. It's a natural personality. People are attracted to him. But that does not build churches. That puts people in pews, but it doesn't build the kingdom. It doesn't build the church. So in Mark 16, and wanting a scripture for this, because I want to take a look at some of the major miracles in Mark tonight and show you two things from them. When Jesus ascended in verse 15, and by the way, I'm a scholar, but not smart enough to believe this does not belong in the book. Those who don't believe the last verses of Mark 16 don't belong in the Scripture are those who don't believe any form of healing or miraculous at all should be in the Scripture. But I've proven to myself satisfactorily they're there. The oldest Greek text we have is the Peshitta. Now, the oldest standard text we have is the Botanicus and the Alexandrus in the Vatican Museum from the 4th century. About 440 A.D. is the oldest one. However, the Greek branch, not the Roman branch. Because how many of you know there was a church in existence before the Roman Catholic Church? It was the church. And headquarters were not in Rome, but in Antioch. And Constant, what is now Constant, what used to be Constantinople. Now, I, I guess it's Istanbul now, isn't it? But anyways, there was the Eastern and the Western Church. The Eastern Church is Greek. They spoke natural Greek. The scriptures have never changed. There is a translation called the Peshitta. The oldest that we know that we have going back to the second century. And these blessed verses in Mark 16 are there. Furthermore, in the Antinesian Fathers, all of these verses are included. Polycarp sat at the feet of John the Apostle. He wrote about these verses. So if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. 
And if it's good enough for us, then we're going to read them tonight. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a bad translation. It's teach. Teach the good news to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Two things. Number one, he who believes and then they do something baptized will be saved. There's something God does. There's something man does in response to what God does. How many of you know the Bible teaches that you and I as believers can have total deliverance? We certainly can. It's the book. It's the position. But working in out pragmatically is something else. About as quick as you think you've got a problem licked, <laughs> if you're not careful, it's back. Jesus said he would come back with seven little fellows worse than him. So positionally, it is true. Positionally, I'm safe. I'm just as assured to sit at the right hand of the Lord in eternity as I can be. Why? It's in the book, Ephesians 2, 5, seated in heavenly places. But to work it out in my daily life, don't talk to my wife. She won't agree with it. She's saying, Lord, do something to that guy. He says, I'm doing all I can. I'm God. Doing all I can. I have to work slow. <laughs> These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Can I give you just a little short testimony before we look at this? Because what I want to do tonight and probably the next session, because I can't get it all done tonight. Irma must be in bed by 10 o'clock. <laughs> I, I personally have been really concerned about the attrition rate in the church. People are getting saved like you can't believe, but they're not staying. Pastors call it the revolving door. I was academic dean of a college, bringing it to accreditation in Tulsa, and that's what we talked about every Monday morning, administrators. The revolving door. hundred people saved on Sunday and 102 left on Monday. What can we do? So we were looking for prayer, intercession, programs. My wife was reading today in a magazine, this thing that's happening in Russia is so brand new, it's gorgeous. But already, the culture of the West is beginning to take over. Communism is dead. But what communism promoted is a lie. Atheism. There is no God. And American culture is moving in. I read an article in the International Religion Report probably as much as three years ago. That at a World Booksellers Convention they had in Moscow, Madeline Murray was there from Austin, Texas, promoting her books on atheism. But no one was buying anything dealing with atheism. Do you know why? They'd had 70 years of it in the educational system from the cradle to the grave. And the Russians have learned evolution between the goo and you. There's a zoo. And I can tell by your face you're of the monkey race, so you will probably act like a monkey when you grow old. It doesn't work. It does not work. And what they observed at that World Book Sale is all these Christian organizations giving out Bibles. Last year, when the Supreme Soviet Legislature met, they were in a big session. What are we going to do? And all of a sudden, someone stuck their head in, and every legislature split. You know what the man said when he stuck his head in? There's free Bibles out here. And everyone left their duty of disintegrating the Soviet Union to get their free Bibles. I wish our liberals in Washington would wake up and listen. I wish our school teachers would listen. I wish the woman who runs the National Education Association would get just a little minute part of intelligence and listen. They're repeating history that is not working. So what the International Religion Report said that the aftermath of this, what can they do to stem the tide of this evangelicalism, fundamentalism that's coming into a nation. One of the men says, but what are we going to do? We have taught Darwin. We've taught evolution and every atheism for 70 years. And they're rushing towards this Christianity deal. 
And one of the men, with a vision hatched in hell, I'm sure, said this, Don't worry, just give them time. The West has freedom of religion. In Germany, 2% go to church. They have a state church. The Lutheran church is the state church. Federal taxes paid for it. Only 2% bother to go to church. In England, where the Episcopalian church is the state church, one and one half percent go to church. And they said, but look at America. Pluralistic, total religious freedom. And no one pays any attention to it, including those who believe it. When a word church can have 9,000 members and less than 3,000 attend any Sunday, something has gone wrong. When I got saved, we didn't count Sunday morning and Sunday night and the nursery and Sunday school. We counted the Wednesday night prayer meeting, and that was the strength of our church. I've been concerned. I've been concerned. Because everything in America has become grossly materialistic. This is how to be a bishop without being religious. That is the title of a book. It's God's will for every one of you to be rich. I mean Rolls Royce rich. Well, you just saw the scandal on prime time. Where there's smoke, there's fire. I don't see how anyone can live in three or four multi-million dollar mansions at once. Or why anyone needs a $132,000 rowboat. I don't have any. And I eat a lot of fish. It's fun getting them. There's a self-centeredness. And that's not the way the church is going to grow. Priests don't stand before God to get ministered unto. They're intercessors. They're mediators. They're standing between and so two things I want to bring out of these miracles tonight. Number one is the type of people who came to Jesus. I'll tell you this. They were religious rejects, social cast off, smelly street people, blind beggars, demon-possessed prostitutes. And secondly, the attitude of Jesus Christ towards these people. You see, friends... Religion practices exclusiveness. We four, no more, Acts 2, 4. We are God's chosen people. And if you don't like it, go to hell. Religion says you must talk like us, think like us, dress like us, and act like us, or you ones can't be one of us. I don't wonder the white church hasn't been able to reach some of the black communities. With the music in the white church, who wants it? I always said if I ever pastor again, I'm going to be my black song leader. And he better not be stiff and sober. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Religion is exclusive. It's a social club. Now, did Christ die for the social club? Hmm? Did he die for this religious country club set? Or did he have his arms extended for whosoever will may come? The thing that prompted this message, I was reading something published by a reporter on national radio. I don't listen to national radio very often. They're, they're, they're too liberal. They're sick. They call themselves educators. Well, I are one, and I don't buy what they're teaching. But they were talking about the world's liberals. And do you know who was number one? Not Kennedy. Jesus Christ. And I said, hey, 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 I'm from Vermont. If you don't know what that means, it means this. Vermonters are the last of the real conservative right-wing Republicans. In 1932, my dad said the only state in the Union who was loyal to the American Republic and voted for Hoover was Vermont. Everyone else voted for Franklin Deficit Roosevelt. And I know my Jesus. My wife and I came out of Jehovah's Witnesses, and if you know nothing about them, they're the world's greatest skeptic and scoffers. They are professional unbelievers. And we weren't Johnny come lately. Her father was one of the pioneer founders of the movement, learned the teachings under Charles Russell. So I'm kind of partial to the Lord Jesus. My wife and I got saved because the Lord healed our daughter's club feet without our permission. And without the Watchtower Society's permission. 
and without our doctor's permission. In fact, it scared him so badly, he wrote a note and something he said, leave me alone. I don't want to be involved. So it's too late to tell the Tromley family the day of miracles has ceased when Moses crossed the Red Sea. That was the last of the big timers. We've had them. God heal my daughter. My number two daughter was hit with a truck and left for dead. I mean, not left for dead, but she had all the death symptoms. No heartbeat, no pulse, no blood pressure in Sioux City, Iowa. But today she's so feisty, I wish there was a little slowness in her that she doesn't have now. My son laid a motorcycle into a drunk driver's car, and if he read kicked out of the kingdom, the title play a G-string, play a G-chord on me. His whole right side of his brain was ripped out. They said he would never function. He makes his living with his mouth. He could sell Chapataquitic Bridge to a certain senator if he could get him on the phone. <laughs> Gladys had her miracle. She lived with me all these years without divorcing me. She was tempted. No, I'm sorry. She said she was never tempted to divorce me. She was Divorcees have a problem in the church. Murderers get forgiven. I never had mine till last February when I had this massive myocardial infarction, heart attack. Came in last night. Irma didn't recognize me. I'd lost so much weight. I lived the American way from one fast food stop to another. My clothes got bigger and bigger. I lived by faith, and I wanted everyone to know I had lots of it. But I also took it by faith. This thing started on a Friday night, but I did not go to the doctor. I suspected what it was. You don't hurt like you hurt when you're having a heart attack without realizing. You just know. But we did not go to the doctor. Instead, we got up Saturday morning and drove from Tulsa to Texarkana, Texas, five hours. And when I would get outside the cold air, I just couldn't breathe. It hurt always. But Sunday, I preached twice. And did not play around with a 20-minute sermon. I gave it all I had. Monday morning, we got up and drove home. I hurt all the way Gladys drove. Finally, at midnight that night, they finally talked, my wife and daughter taught me into going to Hillcrest. And a doctor friend of mine met me there, a cardiologist, and they did an EKG in the blood enzyme. And he says, you've already been through the heart attack. Your enzymes are up over 3,000. They should be 1,500. They started back down, so you're over the heart attack. And the EKG showed the left lower ventricle was dead. It had been starved for blood, had not been given any attention. Now, when you get that bad, you don't have bypasses. Bypasses bypass the problem. They just make you feel well enough so you can still pick out a children's breakfast spot. And death is delayed for a little while. Well, I spent a few days in the hospital, and they sent me home. And on that Friday night, I felt so good. I went and preached for a friend of mine in North Tulsa, John Benson, black brother. And they ain't no white folk in this church. So they get with it. And when I got with them, I got with it. But the next morning, I thought I was dying all over again. So they hauled Gladys, hauled me back down to Muskogee, and they put me in the cardiac intensive care unit at the Veterans Hospital. And uh, sure enough, they was wiring heparin into me. They was putting nitro into my veins, had me all wired up. No curtain around me. I mean, I'm right in the middle of the intensive care unit. Gladys had just got me settled down and left. And I said to this little spirit-filled nurse, that already, she'd already got acquainted, she said, I want you to know we're praying. God's in charge. I said, he better be. I said, the way I feel, I'm going to start singing, come in home. Come in home. And I, I said to this nurse, I said, I, I, I feel sick. I said, I, I'm getting faint. And boy, when I came to, I just was gone. When I came to, they had... Well, two doctors and three nurses, four nurses working on my bed, had my feet jacked up in the air. And, oh, I felt so weak, but I felt so way far in the distance. I could hear the voices. And I heard the doctor in the hospital saying, the man's not going to make it to money to go to Little Rock. They wanted to transfer me to the big hospital in Little Rock. They said, he's not going to make it. The man's dying. That's not a good way to survive a heart attack. But I tell you, I didn't care. I, I, I just didn't feel. There wasn't any fear or nothing. Just didn't care. Well, he argued for an hour. You can thank Mr. Bush and Mr. Reagan for taking away the good entitlement programs and sending it all over the out to the veterans' hospitals and the veterans had been a real time. I talked to some men been on the care since World War II. It had to be dropped because there's no money left. And uh, he hemmed and hawed and argued. And what he was arguing about was, and I heard him say, well, I'll pay the blankety-blank thing. 
They haul in the air vac, the helicopter from Hillcrest. And the emergency flew me in up there and got me in. Well, they sent me home. They couldn't do bypass or anything like that. They did an angiogram and could not get the wire up through. I saw it on TV. It just curled around. Total 100% impacted so hard he could not get a needle through it. The one thing which helped, I learned later from Dr. Billy James Hargis, was preachers have not only big lungs, big mouths, they've got big arteries around their heart. So talking does some good. Some of you women, if that case, will never die. <laughs> so they put me on warfare and rat poison, called an anticoagulant, and beta blockers and calcium blockers and everything they could do to keep me alive because my heart in that lower part was not beating. And it was afraid the blood that was coming in would coagulate and crumble, as they call it, and have another clot, and we start this thing all over again. So they sent me home, and they made me go to some classes, you know, and they said, now watch your diet. Only eat no more than 30% fat. That's what I had been doing, and it killed me. I've discovered since don't believe the American Heart Association, they're in debt with the beef business and the dairy industry and the tobacco growers. It's a government agency, and Washington is not going to cut off the hand that feeds them. And I've discovered since that bypass surgery has become like tonsillectomies was when I was a kid. Every kid got his tonsils out, whether he needed them or not, because it was quick money. And they're doing the same thing with bypass surgery, sixty to $100,000, whether you need it or not. And many, many people don't need it. Well, they told me they couldn't. So I decided to go on a program with some prayer, lots of prayer, and the thing I hated to do, exercise. I mean, I was eating like I was at 20. But exercise, I'm like, I've been dead since Noah. <laughs> I had to get up and walk and walk. And now I feel bad if I don't get to walk. But I don't stroll. I'm speed walking. And then, would you believe, I became so un-American, so anti-agricultural, I went on a vegetarian diet. Well, I had sense enough to know that's what messed me up. Those 18-inch tin pizzas followed by a rigatoni and fasting for two days so when you go to Shoney's breakfast bar, you can really get up. And all those fried foods. I knew that's what was in my lungs, so <laughs> I went on a vegetarian diet. Was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. Did it taste good? No, it didn't taste good. Everyone knows heaven is going to be an ocean of milk chocolate, going to sink to the bottom and never come up. You don't like no chocolate, you won't like heaven. But I followed it. I stuck through with it. Three weeks ago, they did an echo EKG, another one. That's when they take the sound waves and go inside, and I saw the little valves are fluttering, and the heart goes, poof. But I also heard something else. I heard my heart beating. And it's the same sound you can hear on a penis that's three or four weeks old. So if I'm alive, the baby in that mother's belly is alive. But anyways, when they got all done, the doctor looked at me, wanted to know what I was doing for exercise. I said, I'm speed walking. I'm walking a mile and 14, working for 13 minutes. He looked at me because they had put me on a treadmill two months before and stopped me after eight minutes because he got tired of checking my blood pressure every 40 seconds. And he says, I know what you're going to do. You're just going to keep on walking. So there's no sense in wasting time. They took me off the blood thinner. They took me off the beta blocker, the calcium blockers, took me off all the drugs and medicine. I don't need it. My lower heart's working. I said, it's working. I said, it's working. Was it a miracle? I don't know. It was dead, but it's working. Do I have any pain? No. Heart problem? No. Still running and jogging? Yes. Still eating hamburgers? No. Never. Again, do I give God the glory? Yes, I do. Because I've decided to live until I die. But the best part through every bit of this is reaching out to others. Back to Mark. I'm going to tie this all together. You cannot do the work of a priest, a prophet, or a king, which is what we're moving into. When your whole desire is for yourself. Now, I'm going to give a $100 check, but Lord, you owe me a hundredfold. Oh, no, he doesn't. 
You give because he purchased you with the blood of the Lord Jesus. And the only thing he's going to give you is Jesus. He's all you need. When I left Hillcrest, the nurses got together, told my wife, said that man's the best patient we've ever had. When I left the VA hospital, my doctors called, checked on me. The nurses in the airbag, the helicopter, called on me the next day. Why? Because I wasn't, am I going to die? Am I going to make it? I was reaching out to encourage and to help them because I was learning something. So two things in these miracles and Mark we're going to discover. Number one, who can come to Jesus? And number two, what to do when the answer has believed? Have you ever prayed and praised? Got a Pentecostal massage, as Bob Mumford says, and nothing has ever happened? How many of you prayed for something more than once? You don't have faith. Everyone knows if you have faith, your faith cannot fail, and you should get what you want the first time you want it. Boy, I wish Jesus could have thought of that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Prayed all night long. That may be good rhetoric for TV. It may fill your mailbox, but it won't bless the heart of the Lord. Something else I discovered with these miracles in Mark, no two of them are alike. They're non-religious. Religion wants everyone. This I believe. I believe in God the Father, maker, heaven and earth, born of the Virgin Mary. It's true. We do believe it. But what if you don't believe it just like I do? I have some peculiar scriptural doctrines. I believe the Bible. I have a problem with the rapture and the rupture. You get the pre-trip, the mid-trip, the post-trip, the amillennial, pre-millennial, post-millennial folks. You got the folks that believe Revelation, previous, futures, historicists, medium, so on and so forth. Who's right? Well, you sprinkle, dip, or pour. Is it once backwards or three times forward? You tithe on the gross of the net. Now, that's important. And you must believe what we believe, or you cannot join our fair church. Was that the attitude Jesus had? That was not. I discovered that when Jesus came, he did not correct the error among the Sadducees. How many of you know why they were so sad? You see. They didn't believe in angels, demons, life after death. I mean, the devil couldn't have any fun with that bunch. They didn't believe in him. But I'll tell you what, they were the rulers in the priesthood. They still are today. We call them intellectuals. I don't. Any man who doesn't have the fear of God in his heart is not intelligent. He's stupid. But they are the leadership. Jesus let them go. Did he ever try to straighten out the Pharisees with their doctrinal purity, their hyper-fundamentalism, and their religious fanatical obedience? I don't care whether God likes it or not. You don't feed that donkey on my Sabbath. Jesus knew you can't straighten those kind of people out. I remember the first time I wore a pink shirt. I felt like I went to church without my britches on. The suit was black. The shirt was pink. I was afraid someone would see me. All I needed was white shoe. Now I wear all kinds of weird stuff. The Herodians, did Jesus try to do something with them? They were the liberal descendants of Herod. Opened the foreign rule. Snuggled up to Rome. He let them go. What did Jesus do with the Essenes, the separatists? They were so holy, they lived in their own separate community down in Qumran, probably were the ones who gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls, emphasizing the asceticism, don't smoke, lie, dip, and chew, and don't rub with the nasty folks who do, young lady, you're not going to make heaven, as long as you pluck your eyebrows, because God likes one eyebrow hairy from ear to ear. <laughs> and in our day and age, they'd probably say, son, you ain't going to go to heaven watching TV, including HBO. The zealots, they were the activists. Today, they would be picketing in front of the abortion clinic. There's nothing wrong with that, but it won't do any good. I'd like to see a revival come so that the people who are illegally pregnant would have a touch of old-fashioned morality. And that isn't going to come till some of you folks start going to PTA and lift out up your voice and say, Enough! Someone has to vote in the local school board! You want to get in spiritual warfare? There's our good place to start, but you better be prayed up when you go. And say, I'm again it, I'm again it, I'm again it. Jesus didn't preach against any of the things. The Hellenists, they were the intellectuals, accepted the Greek advancement. Today, they are those that have discovered that God did not create. It just always was. 
Carl Sagan said there's a closed universe. And you have all evolved from the goo. Well, you know what? We've, we've taught it, and now we've got a generation of young men and women practicing it. Hopelessness. Jesus didn't try to straighten out any of this mess in Israel. Mark 1 says he came preaching the beginning of the gospel of the kingdom. Not Israel's the kingdom and we're going to rehash it, but a brand new gospel. He said heaven has invaded earth. Satan has been counterfeited, I mean captured. When a strong man is going to meet him and put the rascal out of business, it was a new gospel. You see, Israel had been without the Spirit of God for 400 years. They had had no prophet. You say, how long is that? That's almost twice the history of the United States. And that's like the founding fathers landing in Jamestown and to this day. There would have been no prophet, no spiritual church, no move of God in America. You and I go six months and we're ready to say, who's the next move? Where's the next move? 400 years. John the Baptist came on the scene. They cut off his head. Jesus came on the scene and says, we'll have none of it. You know why? Hear me, church. Hear the word of the Lord. When you go without the Spirit of God long enough, you'll soon substitute your own ideas for the moving of the Spirit of God. I'm going to say it again. The church lost praise and substituted hymnology so that when praise came, they said, we'll not have it. We took demons and dressed them up in flannel suits, Brooks Brothers, alligator shoes, snapping at their ankles, and come into church in a Mercedes. Being rich does not prove a popular preacher is filled with the Spirit of God if he lacks the character and nature of Jesus Christ. You say, how can I tell a difference when they say, send your tithes and your offered. Pay your vows. Send it to me. I've got another mansion I want to buy. God, if he can get sick, is throwing up. It was not the spirit of Jesus Christ. And all of this was going through my mind. And so I sat down and wrote out, what is a liberal? They were talking about social liberals. When it comes to women, Jesus was a liberal. Religion says women belong in the bedroom and in the kitchen. But Jesus was against it. I had to wrestle that when I did the three years of research for the book, Who Said Women Can't Teach? That book's the final answer. Jesus was a liberal when it came to the street people, the destitute, the poor, the rejects, the cast-offs, taking care of people and helping them. And I finally saw it. I said, if that's being a liberal, then Jesus was dealing with people. But that's not what liberalism today is all about. Liberalism today is anything as long as it's not right. Let's take a look. Go with me to Mark, the first chapter, and take a look at the people that came to Jesus. And did he apply religion to them? You're going to discover not once did he say, Do you believe in Sabellianism, Arianism, or Trinitarianism? He didn't care. As long as they believed in him, do you believe I'm able and accepted him? He'd take care of the rest. He never said, do you believe hell is a grave? Is it so hot it's going to vaporize you? Are you going to sleep like an Adventist? Are you going to die like a witness? Are you going to perk in purgatory with the Catholics? Some of you may not be aware, but the reason they have purgatory is because they don't believe the blood of Christ is sufficient to forgive all of your sins. So you've got to go and take care of some of them yourself. The first man in Mark 40, 140, a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down, and said to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was what? Moved with holy indignation, says, How dare you come to me? No, he was moved with compassion. One of the first things you learn as a fundamentalist is Jesus healed to prove he was the Messiah. He did not, says right here, he was moved with compassion. He healed because he loved people, and he felt for people, and he went beyond religion. How many of you know Jesus Christ did not come to earth to start a new religion? He did not start a religion. He said, I'll build my church. But he did not say, I'm going to start a religion with rules and regulations. One time, John and the apostles had been over the hill having one of their first deliverance services, and they came back and said, Lord, we found some fellows over there stealing our thunder. And we're James and John. We're the sons of thunder. We're ready to beat the liver out of them. We forbid them. 
says, hey, man, that's our show. We're the exclusive ones on this. And Jesus said, tell you what, guys, if they're casting out devils in my name, they're not against us. They're for us. Now, you guys mind your own business and leave them alone. Peter's probably thinking, how am I going to get to be Pope? <laughs> Harold Bredesen once said, if you preach Peter's gospel without Peter's power, you will Peter out. What is a leper? Interesting, this is the first one that's chosen. Even in this day, leprosy is considered socially contagious. Of course, we've discovered it's nowhere near the disease they thought it was. Two shots for $109 cures leprosy. Who developed it? The Christians. Who's giving it away? The Christians. But in Jesus' day, all they knew about leprosy was it was slow acting. There was not instant death. It was painful death. And the children, the descendants of the parents, would become infected too because there's a genetic strain to it. It was hideous. Their joints would fall off. They got a claw shape to their hands, to their feet. The bridge of the nose would collapse. And we've ministered to these people in Africa and laid hands on them by the hour. And they never got them. You know why? Because I've got something in my blood stronger than what's in their blood. They said, well, weren't you afraid? If you're going to be afraid to stand up for Jesus, you're going to get in trouble. This was the attitude I had with that heart attack. I said, I've trusted Jesus all these years. I'm not going to cave in now. I feel like I'm heaven one, but winners don't lose. And losers don't win. And it took a while, but I give Jesus the glory. I won. I don't have. Someone says, well, what if you die? Well, someone said that to Bill Bosonsky. He said, what if I don't? My cup's not half empty. It's half full. Right. This is what's wrong with America. We blame everything on our ancestors, our background, our upbringing, our background. I came up in my ghetto. I did too. But I didn't stay there. I walked out one day, got an education, and quit, and took my brothers and sisters, my mom and dad, and that was the last, the last of the Trombley family on the welfare line. And I mean... Welfare today is good. They give you money. When I was a kid. They gave you powdered milk. You could always tell who was on welfare, the kids in school, because they had yellow stuff around their fingernails. They gave us white chunks of look like lard, and they had some coloring you have to put in to squash it, you know, to make it into margarine, to fill your cholesterol into your arteries. Remember that? You could always tell the kids on welfare. They had that orange stuff. And they had all that peanut butter you had to mix up because all the oil was in. I'm looking back. The stuff they gave us on welfare was probably why we folks on welfare are so healthy. It was good food. But it was embarrassing. Because in letters so big you could read it from New York to Washington. Not to be sold! <laughs> I'd hide it under my coat. And I had to go from school up the town farm to get the milk and carry it home. Hide it under my coat. Embarrassed. Falling into a shell, it was terrible. I felt like a leper. Because in Jesus' day, the leper had to walk down the street crying, Ola, Ola, and everyone backed out of the way. He was a leper. They couldn't live inside the town with families. They had to live outside. They were rejected. They were the lowest of the low. Social outcast. Disease. Rejected, couldn't go to the temple. Although God gave Moses specific instructions on what the leper would do, he'd come to the priest that ministered to him. He'd come back a week later and check. But in Jesus' day, they had gone so long without a priesthood in contact with God. When Jesus went into the temple, he said, Your house is like... He didn't say my house. He said, Your house, not my temple. Your house is empty. The lepers are sick. Dying. No one to bind up their wounds or care for them. Because we have a religion without a Christ. And that man came to Jesus. He bowed. Humbled himself. Now, did Jesus accept him? There's no evidence he rejected him. And you know what the leper said? If you're willing. He did not say, if it be thy will. There is a difference. If it be thy will, then the leper didn't know whether he could or not. But if you're willing, he knew he could, but did not know if he would. Number one, he's a rabbi, and rabbis can't go near unclean people. 
that if you had a pimple on your nose, the rabbi couldn't get near you because the Pharisees said, that makes you unclean. Dear God, what are you going to do with the high school kids in church with acne? I mean, they had some stupid laws. And they weren't ordained of God. That's why Jesus never paid any attention. That which was of God. He healed this leper and says, go show yourself to the priest. That's what he should have done in the first place. But the priests were out of the will of God. Are you following me? Did Jesus accept them? Yes. What happened? He reached out and touched him. Now, the Jewish law said that if a leper touched a rabbi or the rabbi touched the leper, he would be clean, ceremonially unclean for 24 hours and have to go through ritual immersion and the whole thing. But Jesus goes above and beyond the legalism of religion and touches this man. You know why? Because he was not a man who thought he was God. He was a man who knew who he was. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. I like that because if what Jesus did was what the Father is doing, and God can't change, He's still doing it today. And I don't care who the seminary is, the church, the denomination, or the theologian, they're fools when they say God goes against His own nature. It is His nature. Yahweh, Rafekha. You call it Jehovah Rapha. It is His nature to heal. It's his nature to save. It's his nature to bless. It's his nature to give. And he cannot change. We've got to get that into our spirit. So that when we reach out to these masses of sick, rejected, afflicted, demonized people, we cannot look my power, my authority, because it won't work. It has not been working and it won't work. We're nothing but a tool in the hand of the Lord Jesus. And he wants to reach out to those people. I like that. Who can calm the lepers? Who can calm the ones no one else wants to? Right now, the big problem in the church is those with AIDS. Hmm? You know why? We're ignorant and fearful. AIDS is 20th century leprosy. Was Jesus afraid of contacting it? There's only one person get AIDS, bad blood transfusion, or someone mixed up in sodomy. Should we be fearful? The priest stands in the presence of God for the people with no concern for himself. His life is total commitment. Now, there's one thing that's important here. This man had to learn a vital principle. Jesus would accept him. He said, I'm willing. But this man had to learn to accept God's willingness. And there's a basic problem with multitudes around the world. Even Johnny Carson knows God can. He's not quite ready to say he can't. But they don't know if he will. You say, well, how do you know he will? Because I have a contract. In the book. The book. This does not contain God's word. It is God's word. Every chapter, every verse, every line. Well, how about these preachers and their contradictions? Find the contradiction and prove it, and you'll be the wealthiest man that hell ever promoted. There are no contradictions. There's confusion. There are radio and television preachers confusing and contradicting one another. But Jesus still loves them. He works very slowly. But the closer we come to the manifestation of the presence of the Lord, the quicker those guys are going to go to the woodshed. Yes, in Cornwall, stood in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and prophesied several years ago. Some of the leading leaders in America would be down and out in 18 months. Swigert went. Gorman went. John Wesley Fletcher went. Swigert went twice. Now we've got three more. In total embarrassment. And it's not just charismatics. There are Baptist preachers in every denomination. Nothing that's hidden is going to stay hidden. It's going to be brought to the light. And if you're not willing to do it with repentance, God will dig it out of you because He can't heal it until it's been surfaced and the scum has been wiped away. Can you say amen to that? Why does He do it? Because He loves you. He can't take you to heaven 
There's no purgatory to go and get it perked out. There's no Armageddon to go and get it burned out. There's no soul sleep to go to sleep it out. There's only one way it's going to get out. Repentance. Bob Mumford once put it like this, and I love it. He says, God will whisper in your ear in a still, small voice. But if you don't listen and obey, he'll slap you with Ann Lander's wet noodle. <laughs> and if you still won't obey, he said, duck, because God's going to bless you with a brick. Duck. Mark, the second chapter. We'll take a look at this and then close for tonight. Aren't you glad he's reaching out towards the lepers? That's why he went behind the Iron Curtain. Tremendous revival going on over there. But America's taking God for granted. Tongue talkers go to church on Sunday morning. And maybe we'll come out Sunday night if Copeland's there. But forget it the rest of the week. When preachers divorce their wives. If a preacher can't get along with his wife as a spirit-filled, word-empowered Christian, how can he help anybody else in the church? Who knows? Maybe God hooked you up with that miserable woman like he did John Wesley. The secret of John Wesley's tremendous ministry, you may not be aware, his wife was a shrew. What's that? I don't know, but that's what he said. <laughs> she was so negative and miserable, she kept him on his knees praying. And that's why he had such great deliverance and power with God. So that's why you're married. One diamond polishing another diamond. Hmm? Let me tell you how I learned to handle it. <clears throat> I said, Lord, I'm having a problem with your daughter. And I discover she's praying the same thing. Hmm. So we both go to the woodshed. He says, when I get done with you kids, you're not going to act like your in-laws. <laughs> In the second chapter... The first nine verses is the account of Jesus going back to Capernaum. He goes into a house that's absolutely filled with people. Every time I read this, I get provoked because this is the way Christians are today. I live in Tulsa, Broken Arrow. And we have the great charismatic Bible ministers fellowship, the Kenneth Hagin camp meeting. I don't go because I can't get a seat. I have to work. And when I go at night, there are no seats. Because if the meeting starts at 10 o'clock in the morning at 6, they grab the seats and put their books and Bibles on them. God have mercy on you if you move one another. And if the ungodly come in, they've got to go so far back in the balcony to get a seat. So I don't bother going. I get it secondhand on television and I can see the white of their eyes. This is what happened when Jesus went to this house it filled up with all of the scribes and Pharisees now they weren't there to learn they were there to criticize they were trying to find a way to hang one on Jesus because you see everything he did was against the grain of organized religion he accepted their rejects their cast outs their, their, he did things on the Sabbath ooh and they were so filled with the love of God kill him I don't know who Allah is but he's a monster. Because all I have ever read about the nation of Islam is backstabbing, eye-poking, throat-cutting. You reject me, I'll cut your throat in the middle of the night. And that's been the history of Islam. What kind of a God is there? God, they don't know. They've never heard his voice. They've never seen him. He's never worked a miracle. He's never done anything. All they know are the, ra are the ravings of an epileptic. Muhammad would go into a cave and probably had seizures. We know he was epileptic and came out with all this weird. And if you've ever studied it, like we study the Bible, the Quran is filled with inconsistencies. The place was filled. So four friends had a neighbor or friend who was not only paralytic, total crippled, he was unsaved. They couldn't get him into the meeting, so they went up on the roof and tore the thing apart. Now. I don't, in my house, if you had four men and one sick man, you wouldn't have to take the roof apart. The whole thing would fall in. <laughs> Down it would come. 
But in Jesus' day, they weren't made like that. The second floor, there were logs four to six inches in diameter, and they laid side by side and filled up with adobe. And you, could, you could walk. It was a second story. That was the roof. They had to tear the thing apart. Now, it doesn't say they got a chainsaw and cut a hole 18 by 18 and grabbed the man by his toes and dung him down. They let his whole bed down. They ripped a hole, three by six at least. They tore the roof. They destroyed that house. Wouldn't that give the ACLU something to fuss about? Fanatics tearing up the roof to put someone in front of Jesus. And finally, this man comes down. And verse 4, it says that Jesus saw their faith. Their faith. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Oh, you and I shall. But that's because you're not religious. They said, who can forgive sins but God? I have no problem with that. Jesus was God. But you know what unbelief is? This is unbelief. They believed Jesus could heal the sick and work miracles, but they didn't believe he could forgive sins. Today, we believe he can forgive sins, but he can't work miracles or heal. If it smells like a skunk, and it waddles like a skunk, and it has a streak like a skunk, don't mess with it. It's a skunk. And if it smells like unbelief and looks like unbelief, I don't care whether it comes out of Moody, Fuller, Dallas, or Springfield. It's unbelief. Here comes the uh-oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are faith people. This man got saved and healed with no faith. None. None. There is a personal, plural pronoun. Not when Jesus saw his faith, but their faith. Whose faith? The faith of the four men who brought him. That man got saved by someone else's faith. That man got healed by someone else's faith. And if it worked then, hear me, it works now. Brother Glenn, you and I can intercede, and it will work. Call it local faith, call it Hot Springs faith, call it Arkansas faith, call it Arkansas faith, call it whatever you want. It's faith. Jesus will honor your faith for someone else. Now, how many of you folks are your grandparents? I'll compare pictures to prove it. Do you know what that means? Maybe the parents aren't doing like they should, but we can get them. Jesus will see your faith and honor and bring in those grandkids. This man is paralyzed. He's unsaved. Did Jesus accept him? Yes. Did he have faith? No. Did he need faith? After he got saved, I'm sure he had some. When Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. And the Pharisee said, mm, we're going to kill him. I'm imagine Jesus. And don't be like that bunch. They're God's chosen. Frozen. I think he was a believer. Paralyzed. Helpless. And I can think of multitudes of people absolutely helpless. But Jesus is ready to reach out for. I read a story in a little magazine about a street man. Poor. Didn't have white eyes. I mean blue eyes and white skin. I mean white hair. He certainly wasn't Scandinavian. And he visited a church on the upper side of New York. Beautiful church, rich church. And he slipped in and sat down in the back of the church. And it seemed so gracious. The pastor never said one thing to offend him. He's a good bum. But nothing offended him. After the service, he thought, boy, this would be a good church for me to join. So his street clothes, dirty. And the worst part about those people is they know nothing of right guard or left guard. <laughs> and a good dose of Oxidol on their clothes would really help. And he shook the pastor's hand and said, Pastor, I would like to join this church. The pastor looked at him. Now, you don't get this in pastoral theology in seminary. It's not even considered. 
So the pastor said, well, pray about it and then come back. Figured that would put it off. Because the pastor didn't pray. Probably didn't figure anyone else did. Not about joining the church. The man was back next week, and at the conclusion of the service, he shook the pastor's hand, and he said, Pastor, may I join the church? It will be such a help to me. And the pastor said, Did you pray? Oh, yes, sir. I sure did. Did you get an answer? No, sir, not yet. The pastor said, Keep praying. The man didn't come back for, I guess, three weeks. He came in again, got a hold of the pastor. Pastor, very firm. May I join this church? Pastor, oh, yes, he'd been here before. Uh, well, 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 did you pray about it? Yes, sir. Yes, I showed it. I showed it up. To did you get an answer? Yes, sir. I got an answer. I t and the Lord spoke to me. He said he did. He said, What'd you ask him? I said, Lord, help me get into that church. Well, he said, what'd the Lord say? The Lord says, son, how can I help you get in when I can't get in? <laughs> Jesus has called you and I to reach the masses where they are. And what we have been doing is reaching the up and outer. We love retired folks with large bank accounts. We love folks with large homes. But Jesus said, not many of those people will enter the kingdom of God. Why? They won't pay the price. But he's chosen the poor, the destitute, the broken. And you know what he does? He takes them and he molds them and makes them into new people. When he said to that man, your sins are forgiven, the religionist said, oh, you can't do that. That's not in the Talmud. And Jesus said, friends, what is it easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Eyes, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to do it all. He said, Son, you're sprung. Spring from your bed, take it up, and get out of here. And I believe that man jumped and ran out. And the only thing that bunch of Jews is worried about, he did it on the Sabbath. That's religion. Religion. I hate religion. God hates religion. This is why the last time the angels in heaven will be singing and rejoicing is when you and I join them in Revelation 19. And why are we so excited? The voice has gone out. Rome, the harlot church, has been cut loose, destroyed. And the smoke of her torment will arise forever. Christ did not organize a church to bind people, but to be a vehicle through whom he could manifest himself to reach out and touch people wherever they are. This man had to learn the lesson. Jesus would accept him, but he had to learn to be willing to be helped by others. My wife and I just deal with a couple. They, I had them in Bible college last year, two years ago. And they're finishing up their second year at Rhema. And she's a school teacher, has a master's degree. Her husband, very, very fine athlete, college graduate, inducted into the New Hampshire Hall of Fame for footballers. They don't know how to receive. They are having a hard time finishing school. They have two children are homeschooling. They're raking leaves, mowing lawns, good, honest work. And a lady came to her. Well, she met her the other day that, that this woman had made some Christmas gifts and trinkets and things, and she was selling them door to door. And this lady came and, and said, just a moment. And she went and came back and gave this lady a $20 bill. You know, that's kind of hard. And you've never had to receive, to receive. She says, oh, I can't. She almost started crying. I can't, I can't. This woman says, the Lord told me to give you this $20 bill. Oh, I can't, I can't. She said, just a moment. The woman went back and came back and gave her another $20 bill. And says, God told me to give this to you. And young lady, you better learn this lesson. You can't give until first you learn to receive. And she was so upset, she came to Gladys and I. And I said, hear me. Get your mind off yourself. God's trying to bless you. Yeah. And I said, when you learn to get as experienced as I am, you'd have taken the 40 and said, you sure he didn't say 80? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that God only gave me 10 minutes to do what I'm going to do tonight. I've got 10 minutes, that's all. 9 minutes and 30 seconds, and the time is clicking away. 
I just happen to have some white miracle envelopes under here with my name printed on the front. And we're going to hand them out for those of whom God... Oh, yes, he told me you got eight minutes left. That's the last you're going to get out of this blessing tonight. We're going to give you one of these envelopes, and I want you to put $1,000 in it. Now, we've already got the first envelope filled. The pastor already gave the first thousand. Now, I want you to get ready. God's dealing with you, because if you miss it, you're going to miss it forever. And if you say, I don't have it, to give you better, because you might leave here and get cancer and have to spend all of that. Now, I've got the one, but I want two. Who bid me two? I want to do. Will you bid me two? I need a two. Will you go for two? Thank you, sir. Now, I've got two, but I want three. Will you go for three? If you don't have the money, I'll take your ring, your walk, your salt, your talk, your hacks. I just need three, four, five more. Have you been to that church? The Lord got sick and threw up again. But you must be careful because sometimes God wants to bless you to another person. A friend of mine, I won't mention his name, we all know him, very, very fine minister. One of the most popular teachers we had in the charismatic move in the early days came from back east. And his mom was attending a little church in New York State. The pastor didn't like her because he was jealous of her son. Bob was a great teacher, tremendous sense of humor. His eyes would get so big, he'd almost take and roll them down the middle of the aisle like bowling ball. And one morning early, the Lord woke Mrs. M lady up. <laughs> And said, during the service this morning, the pastor's going to be sick. He had heart trouble and diabetes and was not getting any better. Going to get sick. And I want you to go up and tell him, the Lord told me to pray for you. And if he lets you pray for him, I'll heal him. Well, she thought she was having a nightmare. Because she knew how the pastor thought of her. But she woke up the next morning, she went to church and sat in her little place back there. And during the service, the pastor began to get blue. And, <laughs> oh, I'm sick, pray for me. She says, God, you're not kidding. So she knew the Lord was in it. She rose and came forward, looked up. And the pastor didn't see her until she said, Pastor, and he saw her. Then he almost had a severe coronary. And she said, the Lord told me to pray for you. Oh, well, fine, fine, thank you. You just go sit back there and pray. As far as I know, that preacher, if he's not dead, is still sick, and he will never, 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 never get healed, because that woman's got his healing, and he'll not get it until he accepts her as of the Lord. Are you listening to me? I was in Muncie, Indiana, charismatic renewal, this was years ago, and the Assembly of God pastor got up and confessed. He said, I've been sick. Had heart problems for years. But I got healed last week. And he said, I need to tell you about it. He said, I was brought up in the assemblies of God. I was taught the Roman Catholic Church was the harlot in the poor of Revelation. They don't use enough water in baptism. And God told Father so-and-so to come pray for me. I said, no way. So he just graciously left. But last week, I got so sick, I went to him. He said, folks, it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. My pride was crumbling. My resistance was crumbling. But he said, I went and I knelt down in front of that Catholic priest. And he did the sign of the cross and dabbed oil all over me. But I got healed. He said, that man had my healing. Does God always work that way? I don't know. I'm not God. I'm in sales. That's management. But I do know this. Christ, now listen, listen carefully. I'm close. Christ is more concerned about what you do than about your theology. He did not establish a theology. He did not establish a religion. This is the end of part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A of the... Uh... Thursday evening service of December the 26th, 1991.
for the Midwinter Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Charles Tromley is the speaker. He did not establish a theology. He did not establish a religion. He did not qualify doctrine. We get our doctrine from the Apostle Paul. All we get from Jesus is this is how you should treat him and you should treat her. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Call yourself a supper and call in the street people and the low down and the cast off and those that no one wants. The whole ministry of Jesus was reaching to those who were sick and rejected and unloved and unwanted. And he made them new for the kingdom of God. And we're going to close there for tonight. Next time we'll discover... Oh, there was, there was a, some religious people. There was a ruler of a synagogue, Jairus. So that's, there's a place for all of you. I mean, I, Jairus went to church in his Mark 5 donkey. He had a botany 500 robe. Jesus didn't reject anyone. From the high to the low, all in between. The only thing he asked for was a willing... Now, we've only covered a couple of points tonight. Then we're going to discover what do you do when you go to everything you know how to do and nothing still happens. He'll still do it because he never does anything twice alike. In America, everything must be the same. When you have a healing service, you line up your catchers. <clears throat> and then you give a half an hour instruction on how to fall. Or you that are sick, stand up. And eight or nine people around you lay hands on you and give you a massage. It's a ritual. Jesus never did anything twice the same way. One time, he healed a man's blind eyes by spitting him. He talked about a tort case of law. The man was blind. He got some dirt in it, made some mud, and rubbed it in the guy's eyes. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. It's a half a mile away. The guy wanders around town with spitting mud in his face. What's happened to you? <laughs> Jesus, heal me. Can you see yet? No. Got to find the pool of Siloam. Why? I got to obey. By the way, that's where the first denomination got started. You probably heard this. The Muddites. <laughs> that man said, this is the way to get healed. So he started the Muddite church, and everybody who was prayed for got spit and mud in their eyes. <laughs> the second one was the Spitite church. Jesus found a man that was dumb. He couldn't speak. Jesus said, stick out your tongue. And he grabbed a hole. And then he spit on his tongue. Say, no way, man. He's got AIDS. <laughs> he never did anything twice. Hello. Sometimes it was public. Everybody saw. The little girl he raised in the dead, he put all the doubt and unbelievers outside. Never did anything twice. Love. Sometimes folks get raised from the dead quickly. He let Lazarus get a dose of stink. And they're there to teach you and I something that will strengthen you tonight. He will always be there. He will always accept you right where you are. And he'll always meet your need. But not necessarily the way you think he will. He will do it. I expected a miracle for my healing. But I've never been sick in my life. I said, Lord, how come? He says, now you can relate with the body of Christ. Very few get instant anything except forgiveness of sins. But I could heal. Through prayer? Yeah. Pray the Lord of vegetables to get them down. <laughs> how is it with you? I've heard folks say, boy, I smoke packs of cigarettes a day. But you're just like that and say, shut up. Because <laughs> I smoke one pack a day. And it took me 365 days to quit. 365 times I threw them away. 365 times I went and hunted them back. <laughs> Crumbled them up and up. Don't tell me you could heal just like that. Wonderful. But most of you don't. But God <laughs> wants to encourage you. He will. It's His Word. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. How many of you know you're going to go to heaven when you die? Let me see your hand. You know why you got to go to heaven when you die? <laughs> no one else wants you. <laughs> Some of you would mess up hell. 
sitting in there looking like you belong to the Episcopalian order of the silly grin. Hallelujah. He wouldn't be happy with you down there. The religious folks that are having church down there would be very upset with you. But aren't you glad he accepted you just as you were and changed you into what you are? And he's not finished with you yet. He wants to bring you into the holiest of holies so that you come out so radiating the glory of God. You're going to stand with him on the Mount of Transfiguration until you disappear and his effervescence comes out. You see, after Jesus came out of the grave, his closest friends did not recognize him. He was different. He was different. And you're going to be different. And there's a world waiting to look at you out there. And there's going to be such a change in your nature, your receptivity, and your attitude. Are you listening to me? I don't know whether Duke got converted out of the Ku Klux Klan or not. But America never gave him a chance. They looked at his past. That's what they did to me. Trump, they talked in the kingdom. Don't believe him. The kingdom is Jehovah's Witnesses. See? Let's not be like that. God's got something more to touch our world that needs help. Amen. And amen. How many of you here tonight have been wrestling with a physical problem and healing for so long you've accepted it? With older folks, it's usually arthritis long-lasting problems. You've prayed, nothing's happened. You've had others pray for you, nothing's happened. You've almost got discouraged and given up hope. I've heard that. No, you haven't. God wants to reach out and touch you and rekindle your hope and your faith in Him tonight. He will. He will not let you down. He will bring you through. But you can't allow the luxury of doubt for one second, forsaking all. Set your eyes like flint to follow him. Wherever he goes, whatever he says. We're not trying to gain eternal life. We already have that. We have him. We're following him, loving him, serving him, worshiping him, because he's all we need. Amen. Let's stand up. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Did you get anything out of this tonight? Or we did a lot of metal, and next time we'll get into some good solid teaching and, and build it. Because there's so much. Every one of these miracles in mind represents a different type of people Jesus is reaching out for. He didn't have any problem accepting the Russians. He didn't have any problem accepting the Philando and the Renamo. He didn't have any problem in Malawi where we have our mission program. He accepts them just as they are. He doesn't say you have to change this and change that before I'll accept you. Accepts them. One of the reasons the cult system in America is not getting the job done, and where I stand in contrariness to some of them, is they want it, they want them all to become Trinitarians and believe what they believe. Well, that's what the Pharisees did. Jesus does, and he says, "Come to me," because they can't get their heads straightened out till they come to him first, and then he will touch them. Praise the Lord. Let's lift our hands. Let's thank him and praise him right now. The fact that his word is true, he will not let you down. He has not let you down. The deliverance you seek is in Him. The more that He possesses you, the less anything else can possess you. Praise the name of the Lord. He still hears you when you pray. He still hears you when you cry. He still feels the groan that cannot be uttered. He's concerned, and He's here now, tonight, with strength, life, peace, joy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Now, if you're here tonight and you've been wrestling, this is what we're going to do tonight. You've been wrestling with something physical in your body that you've just not been able to get on top of. We want you to slip out and come once more. Don't lose hope. Don't get discouraged. Don't listen to what you've been told so much in the last 20 years. You keep coming. The answer is not God's reluctance to make good the Word. Daniel 10 makes this plain. Daniel studied from the Word that the 70 years of captivity were up. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied that. 
and Jeremiah, I mean Daniel, figured the time. And he said, this is it. We're supposed to be getting out of here. We've been here seven years. So he sought the Lord, and he said, God, Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever you call him, is this the time? No answer came. Instead of giving up and getting on to another track, he pressed them. He fasted and prayed. Now, that's desperate. Twenty-one days later, the mighty archangel came and said, Daniel, 21 days ago, God dispatched the answer. I've been 21 days getting here. Daniel says, where have you been? He said, the prince of Persia, Saddam Hussein's great-grandfather, hindered me. Persia, Iran, Iraq, hindered. He said, it took me 21 days of warfare with that fallen evil spirit to get here. Daniel, you're right. Jeremiah's prophecy is being fulfilled. It's on schedule. Get ready. You're going home. Meantime, bye. Michael, the watchtower of Jesus, has come to help me. Michael, the angel, is coming. And we've got another battle with the prince of Greece. That tells us a lot. The answers that you're seeking God for are not being hindered because you're unworthy or because you lack faith. That may be true, but not always. There are evil spirits that can block those answers from coming. But the positiveness is, you've got Gabriel, you've got Michael, you've got any other angel that we don't know their name of, pressing through to get that answer on the way. Hallelujah for Jesus. <clears throat> He's the one who made the angels, and the angels were sent to be ministering spirits unto you and I. Don't get discouraged. I said, don't. Give up. The answer is on the way. Amen. If you're going to come, come now. We're going to praise the Lord. Come on, young lady. <clears throat> is there anyone else? Bless your heart. Hardening of the arteries. Yes. Mm -hmm. The ears grow with the hardening of the arteries. But aren't you glad? You say, what can God do for me? Look what he did for Sarah. She gave birth at 90, and the genes of the grandmothers are in the granddaughters. And I, I didn't nine. see. I know you're not. I was going to tell you that's the next thing I was going to tell you. You've been having some real battles, but we're going to play. God's going to touch that and loosen it and strengthen it. Amen. Father, we reach out towards our sister, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Let healing and wholeness be hers. I come against the hardening of the arteries, Lord. The plaque that you took out of mine, you can take out of hers. You're the same God. The same one who took the hearing and restored it can touch hers, Lord. My daughter, be healed. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, Satan, you will not hinder her any longer. Her eyes are set upon Jesus. He's the greater one. You've been conquered. You've been overcome. Now, loose your hands from her body. Spirit of infirmity, leave her now in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Now, we're going to believe for good things. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Come here, young lady. Okay, heart trouble, huh? Are you ready? Yes. Put your hand on your heart. Because I'm going to put my hand right on top of it. Mm -hmm. And the same Jesus who saved you took a black heart and made it white. Hallelujah. Can take an old, worn out heart yes. and make it new. Hallelujah. Heart, be renewed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Be well. Life and strength come into you. Be well. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You've got a new heart. You're going to find out. You're going to find out. Mm -hmm. How long ago? A year and a half. And it's still bothering is it bothering you tonight? Yes. Mm -hmm. You ready for it to go? Mm -hmm. And for your jaw to be loosened? Yes. And for the eye to be clear? Absolutely. <laughs> and from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, 
I bring restoration to this eye, renewal to this jaw, and healing to this knee. Be healed. Now, you've had that for a year and a half, and in a minute and a half, it's going to be gone. Oh, good. Kick your knee out. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And you're going to discover that the damage you did with your eye as well. Why? Why? Because he loves you. He's moved by compassion. Be well in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Now go your way and discover the Lord that made you whole. Amen. Father, touch her from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. The power of the Holy One of Israel heal you. Father, touch the cause of this high blood pressure. Let it go. Let it go. Be well. Be well in the name of Jesus. Take all of the fluid from her body. <coughs> Just let it pass and discover the Lord that love you as you will. Amen. Amen. Are you taking medication for the high blood pressure? <coughs> You're going to discover what is it doing. In the name of the Lord. Amen. <coughs> My son had that motorcycle accident, and this whole side of his head is a plastic plate. It ripped out the parietal temple and frontal lobe of the brain, just completely shredded, pulled out the right meningeal artery. But he thinks too sharp. He makes his living. God did it once. He'll do it again. <clears throat> this has been your persistent, but you don't get discouraged. You don't lose hope. His word says that he will. His word says this was the benefits of Calvary. Amen. Let's extend our hands and pray towards her tonight in intercession. Two years ago, she had multiple tumor surgery. And she had cancer. It's tumors. Tumors still there. And it's made it difficult remembering just a whole lot. It's not fair. It's the devil. And we're not going to stand for it. I curse those things in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, the doctors can't operate. But, Lord Jesus, you're the creator. I ask you, Master, hear her. Dissolve those tumors. Let them go. Be gone in the name of Jesus. And Father, let all of the memory and that which has bothered her be restored. My daughter, be well. Be well. Rise and be whole in the name. High blood pressure in the heart. Because it wouldn't do any good for me to tell you to go on a vegetarian diet. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. It worked. Yeah. It will work for you. Yeah. The hardest part is going to be breaking the old hat. The ice cream. The cool food. <laughs> and the deep dish brownies. <laughs> That's what's causing it. Father, reach out towards my sister in the name of Jesus. Heal this blood pressure. Be well. Jesus. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Be well. Be well. Be well. Amen. Okay. A lot of other folks would too. I'm going to pray for you tonight. Father, we lay hands upon my sister in the name of Jesus. Father, heal this cord. Make it whole. And Father, she wants a lesson plan. Father, teach her how to say no. Teach her how to say no, Lord. Give her a miraculous feeling of fullness. Fullness, Lord. Oh, my. The spirit of dissatisfaction. Spirit of restlessness. Heaven, its roots going way, way back to your childhood. Let's give birth to this. 
For nothing satisfies. Nothing satisfies. It's a continual gnawing of the Spirit of God who is the Spirit of peace. Going to loose you and come against that infirmity in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Your lustful spirit, I loose you in the name of Jesus. And Father, fill the vacuum with the Holy Spirit. Let there come a contentment, Lord. A contentment, Lord. And peace. And with it will come that sense of fullness. And the longer are you going to baby the flesh, you're going to crush it and bring it in subjection to the Lord our God. Amen. With Mary, you're going to say, So be it unto me, Lord, not my will, but your son. Use me. But I think that we've got that restlessness. We could spend more time perhaps trying to find out the cause of it, but we know it's Jesus is the one who takes it all out and runs in peace. And that's what's caused this continual craving. It's because there's no peace. There's a sense of rejection. Who's coming? Rejection. Be unloved. Feel like you've been cast off. There's some abuse that's been involved in that. We've seen brothers in Africa about half your size. That's why I like to go to Malawi. I'm big over there. <coughs> Who were born blind. The eyes are like glass tubes filled with water. That bad. And watch that sight be restored. And this is not that bad. And the same Jesus that made you, the same Lord that will heal and restore and put that eye back in condition. Thank you, Father. Lord, you open the eyes of the blind. Do it again. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. And amen. Let that eye be opened. Let it function and let it see clear in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. We've had people criticize us by saying, well, you ought not just keep people coming back. I've seen too many good things happen. A.A. A. Allen has now gone on to be with the Lord. Some of you my age remember him. He did more for the Assemblies of God in middle America than any preacher they ever had. Had a son born so cross-eyed he could walk in three directions at the same time without bumping into himself. It's just bad. When he was a member of the Assemblies of God, every time there was a camp meeting, every time they had a revival, that boy was prayed for. Everyone, they had a monthly fellowship meeting. They had that boy prayed for. This went on for 19 or 20 years, several times a year. And then one day at a sectional presbyter's meeting, a sectional fellowship meeting, a lady preacher was there, prayed for him, and sing. The kid blinked, and his eyes were straight. You say, well, how come God waited so long? I don't know, and I don't care. I'm in sales. That's management. The point is, the contract says he will, and he did. Amen. Lord. And sometimes I think he just holds back to, to do something for you and I to see whether we really mean business. Amen. So don't give up. Amen. Press the issue through. My mother-in-law came to America in 1914, became Jehovah's Witness immediately, and that's all she ever knew when she was 80. When she got so senile, she didn't know the bedroom from the kitchen. When you get senile at 80, you get progressively worse. Mother Allen got so bad she didn't know she wasn't supposed to watch PTL. That's bad for Jehovah's Witness. She got so bad she forgot everything she had learned in Jehovah's Witnesses. Sixty years of study, all forgotten. But we prayed, and she got so simple and senile, she prayed. When she was 83, God restored her mind. Everything came back except what she learned as Jehovah's Witnesses. It all came down. But there's a humorous part. She wanted to get remarried. She married, raised 10 kids, but she wanted to get remarried to some man between 85 and 100 who could still see and drive, whose get up and go wasn't completely gone, so they could go to all the rest homes and talk with the young folks, 75, uh, 65 and 70, and tell them about serving the Lord. And she was 92. She got tired of living by herself and went home to be with Jesus. So you don't give up. After Gladys and I got saved, the family kicked us out. God gave us a promise. He'd renew us. Fifteen years, we never saw one bit of movement on God's part. Then he decided to, within months, they were all saved. They've got the strongest evangelical church in southern Vermont. He will. You, 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 the Lord said, to him, you don't give up. Stop listening to preachers. Start listening to the Word. He'll not let you down. 
Amen. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. 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 Well, there's a spirit of strength that's coming into you. You have been defeated. You've looked at yourself and peeled yourself like an onion again and again and again. You felt so left out. But you looked to Him. And although you didn't feel anything, you still trusted Him. And there were times that you said, Lord, where are you? Others talk about all these great feelings. I don't feel a thing, Lord. But you trust it. And now the Lord has come. And he's going to put within your heart an assurance and a spirit of joy. Be thou free. Be thou free. Spirit of doubt, be gone in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Now you're going to go home a different man. I said, you're going to go home a different man. Amen. And amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Now go, my brother, go. Full of joy and spizzerinkum. <laughs> Okay. But the Lord feels the top part up here where my head is. Uh -huh. The very part where I sit on is what I have to need to heal. You've been sitting on it for a while. <laughs> yeah. Irma, you have five minutes. <laughs> We're going to be done. Is it painting you tonight? Yeah, when I sit on it. When you... Two, three, really. Okay. From up here down you ready there. for it to stop? Yeah, I'm ready for the rest of it to be healed. All right. I'm going to put your hand right there. Right there. Right there. Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bring healing to this spine. Healing to this spine. Heal to the spine. Thank you, Lord. You're pulling it up, putting it together, strengthening it in the name of Jesus. Now be well. Be well. For you will sit without pain. Tomorrow you'll sit without pain. From here on out, you'll sit without pain. Be healed in, <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. And what's happened? When she had, had a, injured her back? Yeah, I've been beaten. My whole spine was injured. When she was beaten. And she says, from the upper part, God seems to have done something, but the lower part has been so uncomfortable. She sits. And the last two or three vertebrae, they... The doctors have a name that degenerates and deteriorates and begins to fall apart. But that's no big deal for the Lord. He's the manufacturer. <laughs> and I believe he's done something for you tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We'll see them. All right. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Bless your heart. How long? About a year. How bad is the hearing in that ear? It is pretty bad. You can hardly make out. So if you take my clean hanky and plug up your good ear. Oh, you had a hearing aid in there too? Okay, that was in this ear over here. And this is one you can hardly hear anything out of. I'm going to go around to the back of you. And you know what's going to happen? Are you ready? Are you ready? Lord Jesus, touch this ear. Make it well. Ear, be healed. Be healed. <coughs> Open ear. Deafness be gone. No more hearing aid. A perfect hearing ear. In Jesus' name. Say praise the Lord. Say louder. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I can hear. I can hear. I'm a rascal. 
I'm a rascal. I'm a rascal. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Complete wholeness. We thank you for it, Lord. Amen. Your what? Your toes and your just ache all over? How long has it been like that? Well, that's too long. <laughs> Let's believe right now. Are you ready? An instant manifestation. Father, <laughs> take every bit of pain out of her body. Been there over two weeks, Lord, out of her ankles, out of her feet, her knees, her arms. Now, body, be well. Be well. Move your feet, move your knees, move your arms without any pain. In Jesus' name, let's do it again. Any pain? Are you sure? Was there any pain before? In your arch? I don't know what to do for that. Yeah. You feel better? Now, you, you was in pain, though, aches and... Okay. Is it all right now? Are you sure? Okay, we want you well in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Ten o'clock, right on the bottom. Go home, have a good time shouting and rejoicing. Come back early in the morning. Find someone and love them in Jesus' name. God bless you. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.